Hi, welcome back to the channel. I hope that everybody is doing well. If you are new here, then my name is Brittany Holzbeck and I create content for new nurse practitioners and nurse practitioner students. I have actually created an entire boards review here on this channel for free and I also just do additional content for new nurse practitioners and things that are useful in your clinical practice. I also have a Facebook group called The New NP and this is where I share all of my study guides, my dump sheets, and my PowerPoints in PDF format. They're there for you to download, print, and study. The link will be in the description box below. It always is, but just so you know, that's where you find that. The group is awesome, more so because of the amazing community that has begun to build there. So many great new nurse practitioners like yourself, myself, and you can really just build on all of your resources and connections. So I definitely encourage you to go ahead and check out that page. If you are a returning subscriber, then welcome back. You know how much I appreciate you guys. I love this community and I'm really enjoying watching what is growing from it. So many great people here, so thank you, welcome back. For today's video, I am going to be discussing managing COVID patients in the outpatient setting. I deal with this every day in my practice. I'm sure you guys do too. It's definitely affecting all parts of the world. So for today, I thought I would discuss how to properly manage these patients in the outpatient setting, who needs to be referred to the emergency department, who can be safely managed at home, and then who's eligible for monoclonal antibodies. Also briefly, I will discuss the COVID vaccine, who should get it, who should not get it, and when they should get it. So that's what we're gonna be discussing today. I'm gonna to switch over to my PowerPoint now, but as always, I wish you guys the very best. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel. It helps me to continue creating content like this. Yeah, I wish you guys the best, and on to managing COVID in the outpatient setting. COVID-19 presents as a spectrum of symptoms, ranging from asymptomatic to acute respiratory distress syndrome and multi-organ failure. Our understanding of COVID's disease process, management, and treatment continues to evolve as we continue to learn. We've all been affected one way or another by this pandemic, and we continue to learn in real time. For patients who test positive for COVID, if they are determined to be stable for a discharge to home, then they should be instructed to self-quarantine for 10 to 14 days from the onset of symptoms, and they should be 24 hours fever-free without the use of medications. Patient sign and symptoms that warrant an ER evaluation include dyspnea at rest, a pulse ox of 90% or less, or other signs of hypoxia, for example, altered mental status, hypotension, cyanosis, or chest pain. I'll be honest, I read this and thought that, wow, 90% seems a little low, but I thought it was interesting to note that the NIH suggests a hospital evaluation for those patients with a pulse ox less than 94%. So this, of course, is a great example of a time where you'll have to use your clinical judgment and reasoning to, to determine what cutoff is appropriate for your specific patient that you're caring for. Generally, patients have total symptom recovery by two to four weeks. However, there are some quote-unquote long haulers who have post-COVID symptoms, and those can include both physical and mental health complications. They occur two months or greater following a COVID diagnosis and which cannot be explained by another diagnosis. So what is the follow-up plan for our patients who are diagnosed with COVID? This slide breaks it down really well for you. The majority of patients without moderate to severe dyspnea and or hypoxia or other symptoms suggesting requiring a higher level of care can be managed safely at home. So for patients without risk factors for severe disease and without dyspnea, those patients can be safely discharged home and they do not require a close follow-up. Patients without risk factors, however, with dyspnea, should be scheduled for a close follow-up visit. Telehealth is a great option if it's available to you. It helps to reduce exposure, but also, of course, gives you the opportunity to reevaluate your patient. And then lastly, those patients with risk factors for severe disease, but without dyspnea, should be referred for monoclonal therapy. And then, of course, scheduled for a close follow-up visit with you. Again, telehealth is a great opportunity or option for you if it's available. So what about monoclonal antibodies? 
What are they and when should we be recommending those for our patients? So monoclonal antibodies are specific proteins manufactured to target and treat certain infections, for example, COVID-19, and they have been shown to be beneficial for COVID patients who have risk factors for worsening disease. So listed here are the criteria for eligible persons to receive the monoclonal antibody treatment. Monoclonal antibodies are to only be used in non-hospitalized patients, 12 years and older, weighing 40 kilograms or more, regardless of vaccination status with the onset of mild to moderate COVID symptoms occurring less than 10 days and with at least one of the following risk factors for worsening disease. So those risk factors include age 65 and older, obesity, meaning a BMI greater than 25, pregnancy, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, immunosuppression, cardiovascular disease, including congenital heart disease and hypertension, chronic lung diseases, for example, COPD, and then moderate to severe asthma, sickle cell disease, neurodevelopmental disorders, for example, CP, and then dependence on medical technology, for example, a chronic trach. So also, then notice over here though, other conditions may also place individual patients at high risk for progression to severe disease due to COVID-19. And the use of these agents is not limited to the medical conditions or factors listed above. This list of eligibility criteria was taken directly from up to date, and I think it really just shows how important your clinical reasoning is going to come into play when assessing our patients and determining if they can go home, if they should be referred to the hospital, or if they should be referred for the monoclonal antibody treatment. All right, so what are some different types of monoclonal antibodies that are used in the treatment of COVID? So there are a few different options available and listed here are examples including, and I'm gonna to attempt to say these names correctly, but casirvimab, imdevimab, also known as Regeneron, also the combination of bamlanivimab and atesivimab, which I am definitely seeing more frequently used where I am at. And lastly, sotrovimab. Um, I shared at the bottom of this page a study that was done using 4,057 COVID positive patients with one or more risk factors for severe disease. So patients were randomly selected to receive either IV placebo or IV Regeneron and followed for 28 days. Results showed a greater than 70% reduction in COVID-19 hospitalization and death in those patients who received the monoclonal antibodies. It also showed to decrease symptomatic COVID by four days and can also be used prophylactically in certain populations who have had COVID exposure, including those patients who are not fully vaccinated, those patients who are not expected to mount a complete immune response after vaccination, and for those at risk for severe disease due to COVID. So definitely check out the link at the bottom here of this page if you would like to read the complete study for yourself. For those patients who are being managed outpatient, treatment options are limited and include acetaminophen for fever and myalgias, Teslon pearls or dextromethorphan for cough, adequate fluid intake, rest, and then maintaining their isolation precautions. So the use of NSAIDs has gone back and forth with this population. The newest research has said that acetaminophen should still be used first line. However, if it's showing to be ineffective or not effective enough for the patient, then it can be rotated um, with the acetaminophen. So of course, antibiotics are not indicated because this is a virus. And currently there is no data to support using corticosteroids in COVID positive patients who do not require supplemental oxygen and actually may be associated with worsening clinical outcomes. Also important education points for these patients include instructing them to continue their normal daily medications. If a patient uses a nebulizer at home, if it's possible, switch them to a meter dose inhaler, if possible, to decrease the aerosolization of the virus, or instruct them to isolate themselves when administering this medication. Also educate those patients who are using either CPAP or BiPAP at home to again isolate while using these machines to avoid aerosolizing the virus. Additionally, educate your patients on symptoms to monitor for, for example, new onset dyspnea, worsening dyspnea, dizziness, or altered mental status. 
Lastly, educate your patient if they are not vaccinated that they are able to get the vaccine as soon as they are completely recovered from COVID and they complete the required isolation precautions. This also applies to patients who contract COVID after their first dose. So once they completely recover and they have finished their isolation precautions, then they too may get their other shot. So who should get the COVID vaccine? Well, the only contraindication to the COVID vaccine includes an allergy to the COVID vaccine itself or to its components. For example, if an allergic reaction including hives occurs within four hours of the COVID vaccine, then this indicates an allergy. Also, examples of components that may cause an allergic reaction include polyethylene glycol, which is included in the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, and then polysorbate, which is included in the J&J &J vaccine. However, if a patient has a documented allergy to the polysorbate, although J&J &J is contraindicated, they may actually still get the mRNA vaccine instead. So that's the Pfizer or the Moderna. So I'm often asked by my patients, if they've already had COVID, then what's the point of them getting vaccinated? And I always give them a really simple answer. So yes, natural immunity from COVID infection is great, but if you add on immunities from the vaccine, then this is just a better protection for you against getting COVID again. So this next slide includes different options for the COVID vaccine. I don't think that I'm going to read through it, but I have it here for your reference if you're interested in looking it over. One part that I do find a little puzzling is that the dosage increases from 10 micrograms at 11 years old to 30 micrograms at 12 years old, which is the same dose for adults. And so that I question a little bit. I am of course very pro vaccine. I believe it's the key to one day, God putting this pandemic behind us. I just question if this will change in the future for dosing. I don't know, what do you guys think? But yeah, I think that's going to be it for today's discussion. Tell me what you guys think. Are you seeing a lot of COVID patients where you're working? Are you using the monoclonal antibodies in your practice? Let me know and as always, don't forget to support the channel and subscribe so I can continue to make more content like this for you guys. And until next time, I wish you nothing but the best this week and I will talk to you very soon.